Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Rick Steves Tours Festival of Europe. I'm Lisa Friend, and I'm delighted to be your moderator this evening. It's night 17 of our 22 night virtual travel extravaganza. Now, please put your travel dreams in the upright and locked position as I have the pleasure to introduce our tour guide for the evening, Rick Steves. Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. We are going to Ireland. <laughs> I had my bongos up earlier and I was going to play my Odron, this Irish drum, but I don't know how to. Stephen might be able to help us. We're going to have Stephen with us in just a minute here, and we are going to have a great time going around Ireland. So this, as Lisa said, is evening number 17 of our 22 nights in a row celebration of European travel. And, uh, you know, this is a chance for us to to just um, have what we used to have, but in a virtual way. For 20 or 30 years, every January, we were inviting the people who survived our tours in the last year, our tour alums, to come together and have a massing of the scrapbooks. And we would host five or six huge parties in the biggest venue in our little town. And we would just, it was a massing of the scrapbooks. We'd fly our guides in from Europe. It was just a great, great event. While our guides were in town, we would have what we called test drive a tour guide and we rented every venue all over Edmonds and our guides would be on stage sharing their love of their countries. Well, we thought, hey, this year we can do it without all the people having to fly to Seattle and we can do it much more safely and economically and efficiently and so on by having webinars. So we've been having these test drive a tour guide events all month long and we've still got about five more to go. So thank you so much for joining us. Of course, we're selling tours, but we're also helping people who are going on their own enjoy some travel tips and some inspiration. We don't care if you take a tour or get a guidebook and go on your own or whatever, just get over there and have fun in Europe and learn from our mistakes. One thing we are determined to do is to help people not have bland travels. And that's one thing you won't have when you're traveling on our buses. Ever since I was a kid it seems like i've enjoyed getting people on a bus and making sure we enjoy maximum travel thrills for every mile minute and dollar and i want to stress again you can take our tour or you can equip yourself with a guidebook we've got about oh 50 of them or something like that lovingly updated and you can be your own tour guide but one way or the other we'd love to help you travel smarter so we've got guidebooks covering all of europe and we are just sort of designing those so people can have a youthful approach to Europe, so people can get over there and just um, be a kid again, uh, to just celebrate all the diversity in Europe and so on. And uh, we have so much fun with our groups that join us. Last year, we had about 25,000 people, uh, people just like this gang here, pack and light. Nobody gets onto a Rick Steves tour with more than a carry on the airplane size bag, nine by 22 by 14 inches. We are mobile, we are flexible, we are immersing ourselves in those cultures, we are having experiences all along the way. That's what our guides are all about. And I've really enjoyed this festival every night so far during our festival, having a chance to hang out for an hour with one of our guides and dig deeply into whatever country we are featuring. This is our schedule for the festival this month. And um, everything before what we've done now is posted and archived on the website. So in a couple of clicks, you could go to Switzerland with Robin, uh, Scandinavia with me and Pal, Spain with me and Federico, Portugal with me and Christina, Czech Republic with Cameron and Katka. So many great events. I'm so proud of each of these hours and now they reside on our website as tonight's talk will reside. So people later on can tune in here and if they're dreaming about any of these countries, they'll get a great, great source of information. Of course, tonight we're going to Ireland. Tomorrow it's Germany, then the Netherlands, then Greece, then Italy, and next Monday is our grand finale. And I'm just really, I'm so excited about our grand finale that yesterday I sent an email out to my staff and I said, hey everybody, come on over to my house Monday. So I invited all hundred of us over to my house on Monday. Uh, we're gonna have a, a great time and we're gonna have a great time with you, wrapping things up, just having a lot of fun entertainment about European travel. We hope you can make that. Remember, every Monday, we're drawing a name out of a virtual basket, and some traveler is going to win a free Rick Steves tour. 
to their choice of Paris, Rome, London, or Istanbul in the next two years. If you want to know how to get your name in the bucket, it's very easy. It just takes a couple of seconds. Tomorrow, you'll get an email explaining, well, with links to everything we're talking about today and with information about the contest. It's just simply, if you put your name in, anybody can do that. You get one per family per week, and we draw every Monday. If you want to get there right away, you go to ricksteves.com slash giveaway, and you can sign up for the tour. We've already given away two tours, and we're going to give away two more tours on the grand finale next Monday. But everybody can't win a tour, but everybody can be a winner when it comes to a $100 per seat discount. And if you're going to sign up for any tour this month until January 31st, if you sign up with the promo code FEST23, you'll get $100 off. And that includes for our Ireland tours. Uh, I just am so thankful that we've got a very um, busy schedule of Ireland tours. We've got about 40 different itineraries all around Europe. And when we think about the Ireland tours, we do it with uh, two different lengths. We do the full version, 14 days, starting in Dublin, circling the whole island and finishing in Belfast. And for those who have uh, less time, we have an eight-day trip, and that stuff starts in, uh, uh, over on the west in uh, Innes, and it finishes in Dublin. And we're going to cover all the places that we stop on this tour and that tour in the next hour, because we are joined by a good friend of ours, Stephen McPhillamy. And I'm going to invite Stephen on right now. Hey, Stephen. Hey, Rick. How about you? How's things? Things are good. Big question is, how are you? You are in Europe and it's what, three in the morning? Yeah, and it's the first time, I'm just thinking, it's the first time in uh, 22 years I haven't seen you this week in the Pacific Northwest. Wow, isn't that something? For 22 years, you've been coming here with our guides when we have our annual January Tour Guide Summit, haven't you? Yeah, and so uh, obviously bigger things uh, intervened in the last couple of years, so yeah. Uh, we're using this technology now though to connect like this i like it it's great isn't it yeah because you're um you're busy you've you run a hotel in uh dingle and in switzerland and right now i believe you're in switzerland aren't you yeah so we just uh we bought a wee hotel in switzerland uh two weeks before the pandemic <laughs> so good timing and then my wife my wife and i were uh stuck in the hotel for two months it was like uh like the shining um <laughs> <laughs> But everything's good now and uh, i was back in ireland last week and i'll be back there again on sunday and uh looking forward to a big summer i'm oh, gonna I, i'm gonna guide the first rick steves tour of the year and i'm gonna uh do uh, five in between and i'll guide the last one of the year as well so you're I'm amazing gonna... i am so thankful to have you on our staff Stephen. and i know you're always there when we're making a tv show or when we're working on our guidebook or when we need some help with the tours and so on i bet in your hotel even in switzerland you've got some guinness on tap i got guinness in a bottle here do you have anything you're drinking at three o'clock in the morning no as well i'm going to surprise you uh i'm actually uh i'm going to try uh, guinness zero tonight no alcohol uh -huh. uh, Tour guides have a very uh, decadent life with lots of good drinks and good food. And uh, tonight I'm going to try the zero alcohol. There are many people in Ireland who might, including some of my friends, who would say this is sacrilegious. But it looks like Guinness. Oops. <laughs> it's the same as Guinness. So hopefully it'll taste the same. Well, let me okay. see that head. Hold it up. There you go. Oh, nice. You've done that a few times, even with zero. The settle, even without the alcohol, I imagine. I see you. You have the bottle of coach, of course, which is old school because until about the 1950s, everybody in Ireland who drank Guinness drank it from the bottle, not from a. Not is from that a right? But so look at it. If you see any of the old movies, you know all the old guys are in the bars. They're drinking Guinness from from the the bottle and pouring it into the glass, or drinking it from the bottle itself. Um, there you go. We got to wait for a minute on that, but I'm just so glad that you've got yourself a nice Guinness there and um, Slancha. Slancha, God bless you. To your good health. Yeah. Now you're drinking a zero, and I want to stress we celebrate the traditional drinks, and it's a lot of focus on alcohol. And a lot of people, for many, many good reasons, just don't want to drink a lot of alcohol or any alcohol in a lot of cases. And they wonder can they really have a good time in the pubs and so on without drinking alcohol? There's always a zero alcohol alternative. Anybody should feel comfortable in any social situation in Europe, even though they celebrate the beer and the wine and the whiskey and so on. Uh, being part of the party and drinking a soft drink or drinking a, some kind of a soda or uh, a zero. There's 
uh, because of strict driving regulations, generally countries have a very good zero alcohol alternative to regular beer. Oh yeah, there's plenty, and, and in Ireland now there's plenty of good alternatives to alcohol if that's not your thing. And I also think it's good pub etiquette to buy something while you're in the bar. You know, a lot of people like think that the music uh, is provided free of charge. Um, so uh, most musicians get paid. So it's always good to buy us if you're not drinking alcohol to buy something. Maybe it's nice. All well. right. Stephen, well, thanks for joining us and thank you for staying up or getting up early. I don't know. What are you doing? Getting up early or staying up late? <laughs> I'm staying up late. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, just uh, in, in good form these days. Looking forward to the summer. So yeah. plenty of it. So here we go. Um, this is uh, uh, just a reminder that we've, Stephen, how long have we worked together? Uh, we met up in, in Derry, uh, just after the ceasefires back in 1994. So I guess we're, we're and then I, I was local guide for you in Derry and then in Belfast for about five years. And then you made me uh, an offer. We're I going on, go on the road. And I've never going got, on, we're going on 30 years. I rescued you from Derry. <laughs> You got to, you've been the, you've been the ace. You've done so many great guides, uh, tours. You have just been the inspiration of literally thousands of, of wonderful people. And I'm just so glad you're on our team, Stephen. And, um, uh, I've enjoyed taking the tours of Ireland. Uh, I used to let a few of them in the old, old days, but I'll tell you, I had a great time following with one of your colleagues, the itinerary we're going to lay out right now. But when we think about Ireland, we've got the Emerald Island, and uh, it's called the Emerald Island for very good reason. And, uh, you know, it's a small island, but it takes a while to get around, doesn't it? Yeah, look, that's a, a classic scene there. I've, you know, I've done 250 Rick Steves tours around Ireland, and um, that's always a classic scene. Whenever we hit an uh, Irish roadblock where there's loads of sheep in the road, everybody wants to pull out their cameras. Many of these people have seen hundreds of sheep in their life. Uh, thousands probably but whenever they see the sheep blocking the road in ireland which you invariably will see if you rent a car or take a tour uh, it's just such a classic photograph oh i love it and i love the fact that there's small roads in ireland what the population of the em of the emerald isle is what uh, we have a, a million and a half in the north and about four and a half in the south so uh, about uh, what's that uh, four uh, six million people yeah, and uh and uh you know you get out of dublin it's pretty hard to find a traffic jam but you will find a uh an animal jam occasionally we've been at this long enough where we're kind of coming to a generational changing of the guards with a lot of our favorite old guides and uh here we have in in one of our favorite towns we have uh, don who was doing our tours uh probably back when you you joined us and uh and then barry right yeah barry now is carrying the torch there in kinsale he also uh uh, published a book during the pandemic about the history of Kinsale. So he's he's in great great uh, form down there, leading leading yeah. his the glory. I, I see him a lot during the summer. You know, Ireland has such a fascinating history, uh, Stephen, and uh, Ireland is such good talkers and such good guides. You're so close to your story. Uh, it's just perfect for people who want to be a guide and people who want to enjoy a guide. Uh, of course, a big characteristic part of Ireland is the wonderful pubs, and that's the public house where people come together. And we're very likely anywhere we go in Ireland to find a good pub within walking distance of our hotel and very likely to have music, aren't we? Live music. Trad is a big part of the scene. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, if we ever lose that part of our culture, we're in big trouble. I don't think we ever will, of course, but if we ever did, that'd be, that'd be very bad. And it's just such a positive thing for Ireland, for our visitors to being a pub there, all age groups as well. I notice when I travel to other countries, certain age groups stick to certain pubs and there are certain types of bars. Whereas in Ireland, you could have somebody who's 80 years of age and somebody who's 28 years of age and all, all shapes and sizes. And uh, it's just a really welcoming environment and big attraction for our visitors. And, and if, I lived, if I lived down the street, Stephen, and I walked in here and I had my Boron, you call this a Boron? Yeah, that's the Boron, the, the goatskin drum. And you could have, whoa, whoa, I'm, someday I'm going to learn how to do this. I don't, I don't know how to play it right now. But um, it says in the sign in the back there, uh, musicians only. I can't read the Gaelic, but I can see the, hello, hello. Wow, it resonates with my voice. That's very cool. Um, it says musicians only. So it's kind of a jam session, isn't it? If somebody's a, a, a re reasonable musician, they could sit down and join the music. Yeah, once you, once you check first that that's that, like an open session, uh, uh, usually right. you're welcome obviously you want to be a little bit competent um the bar on when it's played right is beautiful it's, it's such a, a, a i love a, it compliments I, the music but when it's played wrong no it's, it's, that's, that's why 
that's why I don't I don't make a noise on it because I, I respect it. I just love the sound of that thing and, and the ima- the mastery of the people who who know how to do it right. Uh, one thing a lot of people are surprised by in Ireland is the food, especially well for me in the pubs. I love a gastro pub, a pub that takes seriously its food, and you can expect uh, much more than uh, simple fish and chips now when you go to the pubs. Oh, absolutely. The I think the the standard of food has really increased uh, wonderfully in the last twenty. 25 years a lot of our young chefs have uh, been all over the world traveling and uh, they've got inspiration there they've come back we have a lot of immigrant uh, chefs now as well uh, expectations for food in ireland has gone up a lot as well we grew up with very simple food but now it's it's very yeah. good and oh yeah good. And I've met a lot of publicans, uh, or whatever you'd call that, a, a guy who runs a restaurant in a pub, uh, who've been inspired by their travels. And there's a lot of good uh, good influences in the food. And the main thing about the pubs for me is just the fun. You go into a pub, you are part of the family. They say uh, in the pub, uh, strangers are just friends who've yet to meet. Step into the bathroom and, uh, oh, there's a clever use of their kegs. And there's a clever use of uh, <laughs> one of our Ireland guidebooks. You know, what I really like about our Ireland tour or traveling anywhere as a tour operator is experiences. And uh, tell us about this falconry, because that's an experience I've always seen from a distance. I never knew what it was until I spent a couple hours here uh, in a beautiful corner of Ireland learning about this. Well, falconry has been in Ireland since the Normans back in the 12th century. Um, And we have some beautiful birds of prey in our country. And uh, people don't really ever get much access to them. So there are all these wonderful uh, uh, schools of falconry have sprung up now around the country. Some of them are quite historic. This one is at Ashford Castle, um, where you can pay uh, a fee and you go and there's a professional trained falconer uh, who will take you off on a a stroll through the woods and you'll put on a big medieval style leather glove. And uh, you do have to have a little bit of meat in your hand because these birds are not trained to fly to you. They have no real affection for you. They fly to your hand because you have a food for them, basically. Uh, but what a what a thrill there now to hold a wonderful uh, bird of prey, a hawk, a falcon, oh. maybe a golden eagle. You know, I was on this tour, uh, Stephen, and it was really one of the great experiences of my summer's travel. And with the guide, we realized this is not just a tourist attraction in the old days. You know, um, you wouldn't go with the fishing pole down to the the stream. You would go with your your falcon out and you would hunt for critters. And the falcon was trained to go out there and get them and bring them back. And you'd come home with dinner. And it's quite an exciting slice of the culture that we can experience. This shot here reminds me, I was on a tour with your colleague Declan. And I was, this was my group. And I just sign up on the tours. I, I try to take a tour every year if I can. I usually sign up with a pseudonym and I surprise the group at the first uh, meeting. And um, we we had terrible weather in the north of Ireland and it look at the the smiles there. It did not dampen our spirits. Um, And uh, of course, in Ireland, they say there's no bad weather, just inappropriate clothing. And uh, I was just very inspired by how the weather did not keep us down. And you've got to have that attitude, don't you? If you're going to enjoy Ireland, you don't wait until it's sunny. You get out there and you get six different weathers in one day. And you just face the weather and have a good time. Well, I always say Ireland is not, it's not a sun destination. It's a fun destination. If you want the sun, you go somewhere else. You might be lucky and get plenty of good sunshine in Ireland. But look at all the smiles. That's fantastic. And that's I, up on the north I, coast. I love that. There's, yeah, that's up on the Antrim coast in the north of Ireland. No smiles right here. This, <laughs> this, is, this captures how rugged hurling is it is a to me hurling is like airborne hockey with no injury timeouts it's a fast and rough game and this is an example of something that we'll see we'll learn about and we'll even get a chance to pick up uh one of the uh what do you call it a, a bat and it's uh people call it a, a come on or a hurl or a hurley or you could maybe call it a hurling stick if you if you wanted but it's made from ash which is our most supple wood and that's why in the first picture there you could see it bending over the player's head uh, the ball the ball is a slitter and it's uh, cork wrapped in leather and this this is the fastest game on grass and it one of the oldest field games in the world that has been played for, for a long long time very nice look at that oh my goodness now we're going to go around the island here together and remember and these are the sites that we do on our tours but uh, if you're going on your own it's just as good and uh, you can do these things our guidebook is designed so you can do our tour without us and here we see uh who's this young lady here that's molly malone uh aka the tart with the cart every every statue in dublin every monument has a nickname 
Um, Molly Malone sold fish in Dublin, uh, shellfish, cockles and mussels alive, alive all back in the 1700s. So she's the most famous woman in Dublin, even though we're not sure she actually existed. But you, you, you might know the chorus. Uh, you might want to join in. Alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, prime cockles and mussels, alive, 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 alive oh, very nice, yeah, well, that's, uh, when you drive around Ireland, uh, you can't stop singing, because there's, everywhere you go, there's uh, memories of different uh, songs that, even in the States, that we know and love, uh, Dublin has a great university, we got to remember, Dublin was a very important part of the English Empire, I believe it was the second city in the English Empire for a while, wasn't it? Yeah, and that's Trinity College Dublin there on your slide. And that was uh, established back in, uh, I think, 1592 by uh, Queen Elizabeth of England. And for, for many centuries, Trinity College was always perceived as the as the Protestant university. Uh, remember, Dublin has several universities now, but it always, ha from the 1800s onwards, had two UCD, University College Dublin, which was always the Catholic university. Now, that no longer matters or applies. The average student probably couldn't care less. But... Right. Uh, until 40 or 50 years ago, that was a big deal. But that's Trinity College, beautiful campus. And of course, that's where the Book of Kells is kept. Yeah. And then uh, so we can see the, the library and the Book of Kells. And then a uh, short walk from there, we get to the, the River Liffey and uh, uh, probably the most famous bridge in town, the, the Hay Penny Bridge. Uh, what, what is that? Do you had to pay a half a penny to cross it? Yeah, I used to pay half a penny or a, or a half penny to get across. I met a tourist on the bridge there one day asking for directions to go and see Kelly's book, but they meant the Book of Kells, but uh, uh, that, that's not, not too far away from Trinity College. It's in the same uh, same central district in town. There's the Temple Bar. The Temple Bar, is the, that's the, it's sort of like uh, Bourbon Street uh, or something. It's just the place with all the music and all the, the, the people in the streets, and it's just a lively scene after dinner, isn't it? Yeah, and it's generally all the tourists, of course. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. There are some Irish people who would say, oh, you shouldn't go to Temple Bar because it's all the tourists. I, I recommend going there. I, I'm happy to recommend it. I don't think you want to spend your entire visit in Dublin in the Temple Bar, that's for sure. But you should definitely check it out if you like people watching. Uh, oh, yeah. Very music in there. Loads of color, loads of pubs. Not a whole pile of Irish people in there because they tend to go off into their own neighborhoods rather than you know be yeah. so well. You walk across the river a few blocks, you'll find yourself very characteristic local pubs without a tourist in sight. Right there in downtown Dublin, there is so much history, and a lot of Americans are a little confused about that. But uh, 100 years ago, you had, first you had a war against, to, to break away from England, and then you had a terrible civil war. And uh, it's still quite close to the people, isn't it? I mean, it's just incredible to think what your early 20th century was like. Yeah, that's true. That scene there is from 1916, when we had uh, our rebellion against the, the British Empire and the center of Dublin was destroyed. You might remember that famous Cranberries song, uh, Zombie, um, Dolores O'Riordan sings, it's the same old thing since 1916. So that's a reference to this. Um, the, the city center was destroyed. The British eventually left um, most of Ireland, not all of it, the Northeast, uh, what's now called Northern Ireland is still part of the British uh, Empire, of course. And then we had a civil war. A lot of our visitors though, Rick, think that the civil war in Ireland is between North and South or Catholic yeah. and Protestant. It's not at all. It's between the IRA and the IRA. It's quite a complicated one, but if you're with a good guide there or a good history book, you, you'll, you'll quickly understand it. But once, the, when, when uh, the British left Ireland, they kept Northern Ireland and half of the IRA felt that was uh, not acceptable and half thought it was the best deal they could get. And then they fought amongst each other. Uh, so, so tragic. When you think of the tragic troubles before that, finally independence and then the civil war and it's a complicated heart-wrenching uh, amazing story and when we travel there we can delve into that and one of the most inspiring places in all of europe for me is kilmainham jail and Kilmainham, Kilm you know in the united states uh, stephen when we're raised we're we're honoring great patriots in our struggle for independence patrick henry ethan allen uh, nathan hale you know and uh, i got to remind our travelers that Every country has Patrick Henry's and Nathan Hale's, uh, you know, people who love their country that wish they had more than one life to give for their country, as our patriots so famously said. Well, here at Kilmainham Jail, the leaders of the uprising were, were imprisoned, and uh, there's uh, letters that they wrote to their mothers the, the evening before they were executed. And it's, you know, they gave their life for their country, didn't they? Absolutely. And that's a, that's a very poignant uh, tour. The guides there are so passionate. Uh, anybody who's a lover of freedom and history 
Um, mm. You'll love the tour here in Kilmainham Jail. Um, it's something our, that it's a must when you're in Dublin to me to see the Kilmainham Jail. Yeah. And you need to book early these days because since 2016, when we had the 100th anniversary, the, the 1916 rebellion and the commemoration of its leaders has become cool again, if you like. Um, it's become very uh, popular and uh, and um, numbers can be very big there. So you'd want to be booking in advance if you're traveling independently there. And you know, one bonus in Ireland is Irish people are such good guides. You're great storytellers. It's the crack. And if you take a love of history and you mix it with the natural ability to, uh, you know, um, enjoy the language, uh, uh, it's just, it's a wonderful experience. Um, uh, we talked about the Book of Kells. You know, some of the great medieval manuscripts were made by Irish monks 1,200 years ago. And you've got a museum in Dublin that I highly recommend seeing before going out into the countryside. Yeah, that's the National Museum in the center of town. It's a uh... It's uh, on Kildare Street. It's, it's free of charge. Uh, there's an incredible exhibition on the Vikings. There's more gold than you could ever possibly imagine with uh, Celtic ornaments and, and bangles and necklaces. And uh, there's also a very famous feature there called the bog bodies. These uh, uh, yeah. people buried, uh, preserved in the peat bogs. And you know, Stephen, this gold and this trove of uh, uh, antiquities, it goes back long before the Vikings, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. This is way back... Uh, Celtic, so maybe 500 BC, uh, even, even pre-Celtic. So yeah, uh, you know, we just don't know where all the gold came from, Rick. That's a bit of a mystery because yeah. we don't have any huge gold deposits in Ireland. So maybe we traded it. Abroad. Yeah, it's a, you know the more you dig into a megalithic Europe or prehistoric Europe, uh, the more wonder there is there. And just going through these sites, it makes me. I'm thinking about my schedule for this coming year. I want to get back to Dublin. Well, when you've seen Dublin, then you get on the bus and you head south. Rock of Cashel. Here we have one of the great medieval sites in, in all of Britain, I would say. What do we have at the Rock of Cashel, Stephen? All of Ireland, you mean, Rick? You're, you're, what, you're, what did I say? Britain? The British Isles. I'm sorry. If I say British Isles, does that include Ireland? That, uh, in theory, does. But someone like me would call it the British and Irish Isles. Ah, well, okay. Whatever you want. But I'll call it the British and Irish Isles. Or maybe the British and Irish Archipelagio. Um, there you go. Certainly, that's one of the big sites. That's uh, the Rock of Cashel. It's in Tipperary from the famous song. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's in the right in the center of Ireland. It's in the prime farming land. And suddenly you've got this big 200 foot rocky outcrop with this medieval castle, cathedral, uh, place of worship, round tower, all and all perched up there. It's just looking down over the lovely Golden Vale, the, the best yeah. farm in Ireland. And St. Patrick baptized the king there king angus so that he, it's a very important spiritual christian site as well well if saint patrick was there historically that's 1500 years ago he was back when when the fall of during the fall of rome basically when we get to the south coast we get to kinsale and kinsale is it's my favorite stop on the south coast it's got so much it's got great cuisine it's got great history it's got a wonderful old town. Uh, it's got a, a ghost tour. Uh, it's on a beautiful bay. Um, when we go to Kinsale, we have great local guides. And uh, Stephen, you and your colleagues could give tours in every city in Ireland, but it is nice to hire a local guide for a different voice, isn't it? Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah, just, you know, we are, when we are on, on tour, we're with our guests and our tour members for a week or two weeks, and it's nice for them to hear different opinions, get a different accent as well. It's very important to hear all the different accents of Ireland. And uh, walking through Kinsale there with Don and, and oh, with Bar. I, I like. remember we were in Don's car. I know we were, it was 25 years ago because my son is 35 and he must have been 10 years old then. So, well, 25 years ago with Don. And the whole crew packed into his car. And he, we were so tight in that car and the car was heating up as it took us up and down these little hills. And he was just brilliant in giving us a good understanding of his corner of Ireland. And that includes this state of the art in its day star fortress look at that what's so what's so um what's so uh daunting about a star fortress if you're trying to attack this is charles fort just outside kinsale absolutely magnificent mind-boggling the cost and the, the manpower that must have been used but the, as you say there what was what was the defense strategy well no matter what what way what angle you were attacked from the the defenders of the fort were able to were able to uh, defend it and uh the, it was seen as impenetrable from the sea. It got attacked by land once and it was taken. So it's only been attacked once. So it, it's a famous fort because it has 
failure rate. Ah, I didn't know that. I've got to go back and learn more about that story. But one thing I do every time I'm in sale, I make a point to eat really well. One of my favorite chores when I'm updating the guidebook is to review all the restaurants in Kinsale and um, just glo- Oh, look at, I'm just remembering the bread. Oh yeah. Nice. There's in the menu there, you have a, a, a treacle uh, bread. I think uh, you guys might call that molasses sometimes made with Guinness, the nice Irish soda bread there. The really soda good bread with butter, the soda bread. I there's, you can for some reason you can't find that outside of Ireland. It's so good in Ireland. And the and the seafood there with the crab claws and the salmon. Yeah, all. that's that's a meal. That is a meal. And the breakfast, breakfast is good to get you on the road. That's for sure. That's included with wherever you stay. And then we head to the southwest coast and uh, got the famous Killarney National Park, the Ring of Kerry. We stop by a uh, sheep herder, and tell us what happens when we see the sheep herder. Yeah, so that's in the in the, the Black Valley there. It's a beautiful part of the Ring of Kerry, and that's the Kassan family. They've been uh, herding sheep there for hundreds of years, and it's just such a beautiful amphitheater, a lovely natural location. Uh, and then we basically we all we all uh, have a little spectator area. We gather there, rain or shine, and uh, they send off these wonderful border collies, these super intelligent wee guys, and they go off and they round up the sheep and bring them back up into the pen. And it's just a real wow moment for a lot of people who've never seen that. But even just the setting alone would would blow yeah. your mind. You and if you've see. never seen a sheepdog demonstration, those guys are just amazing. And then we get to Dingle. And Dingle is one of those discoveries that I stumbled onto back when I was a student back in the 70s. And it's how I really built my program. I wrote a book called Europe Through the Back Door. And, and half of the book were essays on my 20 favorite discoveries. And Dingle was one of those. Dingle remains just an amazing place. Every time I go back, I, I just remember what a delightful city this is. It's the gateway to an amazing peninsula, which is like an open air folk museum of, of prehistoric and ancient wonders. It's, um, it's got wonderful food. It's got, and what it's got is pubs and lots of live music. It's one of the meccas for live music. And a good friend of mine named Stephen McPhillamy runs and owns and runs a charming little guest house, Milltown guest house, right, Stephen? Yeah, that's Milltown house. It was, it was the first uh, official B and B in Dingle back in the uh, back in the sixties, opened by the Sh- the Sheehy family, who are our dear neighbors now. And then Robert Mitchum, the Hollywood actor, arrives because they were making a movie called uh, Ryan's Daughter. And uh, then the the tourism scene took off after that. Back that was in nineteen sixty nine. And then I was I was on tour there uh, uh, ten years ago, and I was staying across the way at Heaton's guest house. And and Cameron Heaton, God rest him. Uh, he was turning away loads of tourists because he was so full. And I said to him, God, that's crazy, Cameron, that uh, that house, Milltown house there across the bay. It's been empty for five years. And I said to Cameron, you should buy it. And he said to me, oh, no, I said, you should buy it. And I think he was joking. I thought, you know what? I just might. So uh, <laughs> I love he, that story. And you uh, got he, it. Me and my good friend, Patrick Wade from California, a proud Irish American who I had met on a tour uh, we we got together and we bought Milltown House and we we got it open again and we bought our Irish Wolfhound there. That's him, Seamus. He's got one of your uh, keep on traveling T-shirts on. Um, that was a bit of a struggle to get it on and get it off. But anyway, <laughs> good shot. A good photograph. He looks like a happy traveler. And right now, a good part of all the tours we take to Ireland stay at Milltown House. And it's about a 10 minute walk into Dingle, where every night you've got six or eight places with live music and uh Concerts being given in, in the different churches and venues. There's just a lot of musical culture. Tell us a little bit about the experience of, uh, of if you enjoy music and the pub scene in a place like Dingle. You know, Rick, just important to mention to people who don't know Dingle or haven't been there yet. There's over 50 pubs. There's a population of 2,000 people and there's over 50 pubs. That's quite a high proportion of pub to person. Um, half of these pubs have got have got music actually and and a dingle is a magnet for traditional musicians from all over ireland not just the locality although there is a, a very uh healthy tradition of irish music in dingle peninsula anyway but people go there traditional musicians go there because they have more opportunity to play there's recording studios for them to make their cds and their albums um instead of playing one gig a week they could play two a night yes uh, yeah Thomas, no, oh. it's rocking with music it is an amazing scene and just out of town there's a friend of mine a friend of yours named chandelier 
and he's a sort of a refugee from the um what was the big um, uh, glass cutting place w waterford the blow in from waterford yeah waterford crystal had it, it basically shut down and all of these wonderful artisans there's a diaspora and uh, chandele runs the uh, dingle crystal yeah, and yeah. Uh, i was there with a group and it might have been this group here and I bought this wonderful glass. Look at this. Uh, it's a whole set I have, and it is a beautiful. And whenever I get out a nice uh, Irish whiskey, feels good to put it in some Irish crystal. You know what I mean, Stephen? Very nice. Uh, that'll that'll make it taste even better. Sean will be very proud. Oh, Chandelier. Uh, what oh. I think is amazing. Chandelier is spelled like chandelier, and he is a he etches glass. And uh, Chandelier, Chandelier, and our groups get to stop by there. And can I drink uh, Guinness and whiskey at the same time? Is there any problem with that? I think most people would suggest it's a, a, agree that it's a very good, uh, they complement each other. It's a good balance. See, you see, when I was growing up, a lot of older guys would have had a bottle of Guinness and a, and a whiskey chaser, a wee glass of whiskey beside it, just mm -hmm. to slowly sip. Sean is, Sean is representative of the, the side of the community of Dingle who are uh, called blow-ins. We blew in from other parts of Ireland or other parts of the world. A sizable chunk of the population yeah. blew in, blew in like the leaves. I'm from the north, and Sean's from Waterford, and we blew in, and we were welcomed, and we we mixed with the local community, and it's just a, it's a very cosmopolitan vibe there. And Sean's a very good representative of that, and he's doing really well. He's been in Dingle now over 20 years, I think. You know, there's, there's something unique about the community in Dingo that you feel as a traveler when you come in. And, and you guys who blew in, you have uh, vitalized or revitalized the community. But unfortunately, one of the claims to fame of Dingo, along with um, um, the movies that have been filmed in that area and so on, was the beloved dolphin Fungi. And Fungi was, must have been around for 10 or 20 years, but they figure he's gone now. And uh, there's no more dolphin for the, all the tourist boats to see. During the lockdown, people were very sad in Ireland. Many people were, you know, not in a good way. And then we lost Fungi. Just when we thought things couldn't get worse, Fungi disappeared during the pandemic. He'd been there for over 30 years. Uh, he'd be there faithfully every day. People would go and swim with him and take boat trips to see him. And I mean, he, he lived in the bay just out the front of my house, so we would see him often. But unfortunately, he's been gone now for several years. Maybe he's moved on to, and found a mate or something, but yeah. that's what I Beautiful, beautiful memory um, in a Gale Tech. You know, I think it's very important for travelers to know the word Gale Tech. That's a, uh, it's sort of a government recognized kind of national park for the traditional culture where people are, their lifestyles are subsidized and people actually speak Gaelic as their first language and English as their second language. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. And, uh, our, you know, it's very important for us to keep our language alive. It's uh, yeah. kind of a surprise for some people when they come to Ireland to realize we have our own language, Irish or Gaelic. Which yeah. is and uh, yeah, so it's good that the government are supporting it. Uh, I think we need to get talking it more, um, but uh, it's in safe hands. There's a very passionate community around it, and it's good to see that it's being protected. There you have uh, Tog Bog A, which means slow down, calm down, uh, literally take it easy. Take it easy. All right, well, we're going to take it easy around the Dingle Peninsula here. I've biked this, and of course, we drive it. It's uh, it's all explained in our guidebook with every kilometer marked and described. And of course, if you're with our tour, you'll tour this with your tour bus. But we leave Dingle in the morning. You can see the scale there. It's two miles is about, uh, well, from Dingle to the far tip on the left would be, what, about eight miles or something. And um, so many interesting things to see on this loop. And we're going to head around there right now in the far western tip here where you stand on the bluff and you look out at the Atlantic and you say ah the next parish over is Boston this is Slayhead and here you get a sense of how the island has been depopulated in the last couple hundred years because before the potato famine in, in around 1848 or so there were more people in Ireland than there are today weren't there well the, the census showed that we had uh, around 8 million people would you believe so we're, we're the only country in Europe that I'm aware of that has gone down in population since the 1840s. Instead of going up, naturally, we've gone down. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see all the subdivision of the land there, those tiny fields. And if you ever remember that famous Johnny Cash song called 40 Shades of Green, uh, he wrote that when he was traveling around Ireland himself. And mm -hmm. uh, this scene always reminds me of that. You know, you see all the different shades of green in the patchwork quilt. Yeah. Uh, and wow. there's the just beautiful, uh, beautiful, beautiful scenery. 
where the where the waves come in like galloping horses and you see the the barren soil much of it was actually made by peasants and farmers a hundred years ago when they would take seaweed and sand and mix it together and over time it would become fertile soil and uh, you know a thousand years ago uh, monks out here would stack stones and and make a little worshiping place that is weather tight to this day and it stands there and we can visit it the Galaris oratory and it's like an open air folk museum, isn't it, for the deep history of Ireland? Yeah, that's one of the oldest freestanding churches in the world. And by freestanding, we mean there's no bricks and no mortar. You know, it could easily, if there had been a hurricane, for example, that could have blown over, yeah. but it's withstood the test of time. Yeah. There's, and there's Tim, Tim Collins. I've known him ever since uh, you were knee high to a grasshopper. And uh, man, he's a wonderful man, former police chief of Dingo, right? He takes people on tours. Sorry, he was a member of our, our police forces called Angarda Shiakana, which basically means the guard guards of the peace. And he would have been an unarmed uh, police officer taking care of yeah. uh, pretty much the entire Dinga Peninsula with a few colleagues. What a wonderful gig to be the uh, the policeman in charge of Dingo Peninsula, because it's just such a delightful little utopia, I would imagine, from a policing point of view. Leaving Dingo, we go up the West Coast and we get to the dramatic Cliffs of Moher. And uh, <laughs> it's just one of the most amazing places to go. You can see the people up there on the top of those rocks. And uh, I just love Cliffs of Moher. Uh, and then we get to a, a very barren stretch of land called the Burren, and it's uh, windblown. It's got a fascinating mix of uh, temperate and Arctic uh, plant life, doesn't it? Yeah, there's over 20 different types of orchid there, uh, which you know you wouldn't really expect that. That uh, we're like probably 52 degrees north there or something. So we're, you know you're kind of parallel with southern Alaska. Uh, you have uh, Arctic flowers, alpine flowers, Mediterranean flowers all growing uh, together, and a great. Um, cave network there as well rick if you're interested in caves uh, yeah. underground where a lot of our legends come from that's a good place to check out and hiking has become very popular now in ireland in recent uh, the last 10 years five ten years people are getting out more they're going off on hikes we've got lots of greenways now developed by the government a lot of them are along the old railway network so the train tracks uh, are going to go off on a hike or a cycle for as well as you beautiful, want. beautiful thing now this is what we're looking at it's uh, it was the structure of an underground tomb, wasn't it? It used to be covered with dirt, and this was the structure of that. Uh, and then the dirt eroded away, and it reveals the what was there underground. Is that right? Yeah, that's a dolmen, and uh, we we call them growing up. You know, we called them uh, druids altars, as if they were an altar built by the druids, but. I think archaeologists would agree that, that that wasn't the case. These were way before the Druids. These were the burial chambers that were covered in clay, and the clay has since gone. But what, you'll find these all over the country, but they're out of the way. You've got to get off the beaten path to get to them. You know, you've got to park up or park your bike or be ready to take a hike. Even how to get to the you've got to. How, it's, how old can, would you guess that is? On a wet day. So you just want to want to watch. But, you know, if you get a, get off the bus or, or out of the car, and uh, go explore, you'll find many great examples of dolmens and Neolithic monuments like this. Stephen, how old would you estimate this would be? Sorry, that's, uh, I guess you're probably looking at anything from uh, two and a half thousand BC onwards, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, very old and, and uh, around the era of uh, Newgrange, which is our most iconic, mm -hmm. famous example of this, which they say is older than even the pyramids and Stonehenge, not to be mm -hmm. idea. Ah, and Stonehenge. All right. Well, the main city on the on the west coast is Galway, and Galway is just a uh, just a ruddy town with a, a very interesting history and a wonderful chance to have a springboard to go out to the Erin Islands. And these are remote islands. Look at how windswept they are off of the west coast of Ireland. And uh, we can go to Inishmore, the main town of the Erin Islands, and just to wander around the town. There's a special atmosphere on Erinmore, isn't there? Yeah, because it, it's a, it's one of those places where you can't just go out there for an hour. If you're going to the Iron Islands on a day trip, it's a day trip. You know, you're going for a trip for the day. And it's about to have an influx of visitors because Ireland has just had its most ever uh, nominations for the Oscars. Mm -hmm. And a movie called, a great movie called The Banshees of Inishir. And uh, a lot of it was filmed on uh, uh, the Aran Islands and also up in Ackle Island nearby and uh, Colin Farrell is in it and Brendan Gleeson and, and we hope it's going to win a lot of Oscars of course 
even if it doesn't, it's already going to bring a lot more visitors. To oh, the- yeah. And when you land in Inishmore, you can uh, take a cart around, you can take a minibus around, or you can rent a bike and bike around. Uh, with our groups, we like to line up a couple of minibuses and uh, get one of the local fishermen or farmers to show us around. I had the most beautiful time with my family, um, with making friends with a farmer in his minibus, driving around the island, learning about the stones and learning about the economy and visiting Dun Angus. And uh, Dun Angus, uh, tell us just a little bit about Dun Angus before we leave Inishmore. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, people love the, the cliffs of Mohor, but just across the bay, you have the cliffs of Mohor with this uh, prehistoric Bronze Age fortress on top of it. So it's a semicircular fort um, looking down into the wild Atlantic underneath it, and people can still lie there. I'm not recommending you do this necessarily, but you can lie there and look over the edge and <laughs> just have this big breeze ah. come, coming up from the Atlantic. It's spectacular and, a, and a, a, a bit of a hike to get up there, but well worth the effort. Oh, yeah. And uh, so so much traditional culture that we can uh, check in and experience and uh, never forget as we travel through Ireland. Now, from the West Coast, we're going to head north through Connemara. And all over Ireland, we can find the traditional um, um, fuel, which is peat. Peat is kind of like a, a rotted vegetable matter that's kind of halfway to not rotted, but it's sort of halfway to coal. And it's when you dry it, you can burn it. And it really is part of the, it's so characteristic. And uh, this is another thing you'll see in the countryside. It's plowed fields that were never harvested 170 years ago. When you look at this, Stephen, what do you think? What do you see? What do you feel? These were called the lazy beds by the by the uh, Anglo-Irish landlords. And these were basically drills where the potatoes were planted. But then when the potato blight or the fungus came over uh, from on ships from Canada, when the fungus came, Phytophthora infestans, when it came, it destroyed the potato crop and potatoes never grew in these fields ever again. In many cases, um, mm. the valleys went silent. The people mm. who used to live in those little thatched cottages, those cottages in the background, background would once have uh, been thatched roof and ha- had a family underneath and mm. the, their ancestors probably live in South Boston now or the Bronx in New York or God, maybe Seattle, who knows? Uh, just what always strikes me about that scene is how because of the great famine, the potato famine or the great hunger, because it wasn't really a famine as such, because there was lots of food in Ireland, just wasn't any potatoes. Um, and it's more complicated than that, of course. But uh, the the fact that we went from being a, a impoverished uh, rural people, the Irish, to once we got off the boat on Ellis Island, we suddenly became an urban people living in some of the biggest concrete jungles in the world in, in New York and Boston and <laughs> Chicago. Yeah, it's just a very poignant scene. And this is from the Great Famine, uh, 1845 to 1849, when we lost a million people uh, and more to death and to emigration. And those furrows have survived for 170 years to this day. And it's quite evocative when you drop by them. Now we're heading up to Northern Ireland. When Ireland uh, got its independence, the North um, ended up staying with England. It's about 20% of the island, I think. And the capital city, of course, is Belfast. And Belfast is well worth touring. I Every time I go to Belfast, I'm, I'm quite impressed. It used to be a, a rough-edged, kind of rough-and-tumble, hard-edged town. It's got... It's quite comfortable now to me, Stephen. Uh, and when we go to Belfast, uh, you've got some great venerable Victorian sites, this uh, uh, wonderful The Crown Saloon. We've got a heritage of so many great American presidents that have Irish or pre- uh, leaders um, that have uh, Irish uh, ancestry, don't we? And most of it is, uh, is this a list of uh, uh, Ulster uh, uh, Americans? Yes, exactly. The, the, the people pictured here are um what we call Scots-Irish, so they would be Presbyterian, whose ancestors had come from Scotland over to the north of Ireland in the uh, early 1600s, settled there, uh, did very well there, uh, many of them, but um, then would move on to the Appalachians, or uh, Appalachian, you say Appalachian, I say Appalachian states. (laughs) But I I think seven, almost 17 of them became presidents of the United States. 
Lots of, lots of Irish presidents. And actually, when we go to Belfast, I was impressed by the pub scene and the music scene in the north where you wouldn't necessarily expect to find it uh, because it's, it's, it feels a little more British and a little more Protestant instead of um, uh, what we find in the Republic of Ireland. And of course, it was a great shipbuilding center, building some of the most magnificent ships to ever sail the seas. And one of those was the uh, famous ill-fated Titanic, and it's quite a, a boon to the tourist industry. They've got an amazing museum telling the whole story of the Titanic right there in Belfast and a powerful uh, dimension of touring no Northern Ireland and Belfast is to get an understanding of the sectarian neighborhoods, the sectarian communities. Tragically, we've got, you know, Catholic communities and we have Protestant communities that are dug in. It's not quite fair to say it's Catholics against Protestants, is it, Stephen? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, uh, academics would call the problems in Northern Ireland an ethno-religious conflict, maybe similar to what happened in the former Yugoslavia, because you have um, people who identify as British and you have people like me who identify as Irish. And uh, the people who identify as Irish want Northern Ireland to join with the re rejoin or join with the Republic of Ireland, reunification. And uh, those who would identify as British, they're invariably Protestant and they would uh, be called unionists and they want to maintain the union, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which is the reality at the moment. Um, there is talk of a referendum in future uh, where we would get to vote to see if Northern Ireland should join with the Republic again. Um, so we'll yeah. see where that could and be When you go to Belfast, you can help sort it out by touring. And this cabbie here is part of the cabs do their own little uh, mini industry of tourism. And he's wearing a, a badge that has the uh, Union Jack for Britain and the Irish flag for the Republic of Ireland. And the point is, on this tour, you get both uh, narratives, uh, the story of the communities on both sides of the wall. And um, I think it's a very important thing to do. And we're seeing a lot of history in our lifetime, and there'll be history written in the next years as uh, Britain and Ireland sort out these differences. We have an interesting situation now where you know, Scotland voted to stay with England as long as thinking England is part of the EU. Ireland's part of the EU, but England's out with Brexit. Scotland feels like it was done a bait and switch and they'd like to have another referendum. And if they did, I don't think they would have voted to stay with England had England not been in the EU. Now they're stuck in England that's out of the EU and Scotland might want to have a referendum and break away. And if Scotland breaks away because of that, that kind of maroons Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland might have reason to say, hey, if Scotland's gone, we don't want to be stuck with London. We want to join the rest of Ireland. Is that a possibility, Stephen? Definitely a possibility. Um, there's a dynamic now that was never there before. I don't think anyway for a uh, united Ireland. And uh, more and more people are talking about that. And even friends of mine who are friends of mine who are from the Protestant, British or loyalist community are starting to be open to the idea yeah. because a lot of them are actually pro-European and pro-EU as well. Or, so there's a lot of different complexities there, but I think for the first time, there's a strong possibility of a referendum uh, on reunification. And do remember also a lot of the Protestant uh, British people of, the, of Northern Ireland or of the North of Ireland um, have a strong affinity and identity with Scotland. Uh, uh, yeah. Their Britishness, uh, their British identity is often tied in with their love of Scotland and their ancestral links to Scotland. Yeah. Uh, Scotland was to break away from the United Kingdom and was no longer British, well, that would create some sort of dilemma. Yeah. And I think the differences are founded not on religious style, but I think it was economic kind of fear in the old days. And the Protestants, when I was younger traveling in Ireland, Northern Ireland was a stronger economy and it was tied and benefiting from Britain, you know. And I remember physically, if you drove from Belfast to Dublin, as soon as you crossed the border, it was a much more poor country when you got into the Republic of Ireland. And I could understand people in the North being a, kind of afraid to get into this more impoverished country. But since then, that's a whole generation. The Republic of Ireland has uh, thrived to the point where you feel no economic difference between the North and the South. Yes, absolutely. You heard the old one, Rick, about the, the man, man in Belfast who didn't want to be a didn't want to be anything. And one of the guys said to him, are you, are you Catholic or Protestant? He said, I'm a, I'm an atheist. And they said, but are you a Catholic atheist or a Protestant atheist? <laughs> so there you go. That's the, that's the funny, funny thing about that. 
problem. And when we go, I'm fascinated in political struggles and sectarian situations all over the world and, and the, the horrible, sad consequences of the plantation of people. You know, it was Scottish Protestants planted in Ireland just to give England a foothold up there, I think. And today, hundreds of years later, they're still paying the price um, because they were going against the indigenous nature of things. Um, just like we see the plantation of peoples all over the world, the settlements in Palestine would be perfectly related to that. And as you travel around, you see street art, and this would celebrate um, a Republican here, uh, Bobby Sands, who died in a hunger strike, and this would celebrate uh, uh, King William, which would be a, a unionist, right? So uh, there's so much bitter history, and uh, Ireland is working it out in an admirable way, I think. And as I remember on our tour, we would stop at what's called the Peace Wall and we'd get out and we'd write our wishes for the communities of Ireland to get it together and figure it out. Uh, Stephen, I met you uh, back in the 90s in Derry. I took one of our groups here and we had you as the guide. There you are, you little squirt. Yeah, I think that was the that was the, the 95. That was the year, the summer after the IRA ceasefire, which was 94. So. In 1993, there was no tourists. I'd never seen a tourist in my life growing up. And then in 94, the IRA called a ceasefire. And then suddenly in the summer of 95, this tsunami of tourists arrived. Yeah. Okay. They want to see the place. They, they've, they've got fat, uh, ancestry there or they've heard about it. They want to see the beauty of it. But of course, the British Army are still there in the background. Look, you can see the big observation tower. Yeah. Uh, I have... I have uh, you know, daughters in Derry uh, uh, who are in their mid twenties now, and to them, the concept of yeah. surveillance sort of powers and cameras is just so far, and they would never. Yeah. You know, um, when I was there, I have an ethic of never taking a group to Ireland without going to North and the South, if I can at all help it. If you've got enough time, you really want to have the whole picture, and that means include the North. There's certainly no reason to stay away from the North from a safety point of view, like some people would think. But when we visited on this tour, um, I think I took this photograph and. Um, we actually, the mayor of Derry or London Derry, depending on your politics, actually invited us into his office. Do you remember that? And I got to, he gave me this big ribbon and I was a tour guide and I took a group of Americans to Derry and uh, we had such a great time with you that I said, hey, Stephen, I think uh, I'd love to have you on my team. And I'm so glad that I was able to talk you into doing tours of more than Derry. But here's a, a very beautiful and inspirational bridge. What's the name of this bridge? That's the Peace Bridge built in the uh, right through the middle of Derry there, joining um, the east and west bank of the River Foyle. So I, I think this bridge is fantastic, well, not just visually, but what it has achieved, because the, the vast majority of Protestant people in Derry who would call it London Derry, they live in they live in the side uh, that you can that we're looking at there on the east bank. And then on the west bank, you have this overwhelming majority, over 98% probably, of uh, Catholics or who identify as Irish. And nobody really ever went across to each other's side very much. And then oh. suddenly this bridge is built and everybody's going across. And that, you see that building on the other side, Rick, by the way, that white building, that, that's the former British Army base. Wow. Uh, yeah. Wow. And now we've got a beautiful statue that just says, hey, let's get it together. <laughs> We can sort this thing out. I'm so thankful for that. And I'm so thankful for, as a as a tour guide and a, and a tour producer or whatever we call myself, uh, that we've got the Antrim Coast. The Antrim Coast is fascinating, and that's the northern coast of the island of Ireland. There's a resort there called Portrush, which I think is a great place to make for a base. You've got the Giant's Causeway, which is this amazing basalt uh, figuration of all of these eight, uh, what is it, six-sided uh, um, pieces. What, what do we got going on here at Giant's Causeway? Um, some people think it was built by a giant called Finn McCool uh, who fought the Scottish giant thousands of years ago but uh, it's a um, result of volcanic activity this is basalt or basalt rock hexagons uh, they estimate 60,000 perfect hexagons it's, it's very impressive and uh, <laughs> it, but we know when you started coming up first to the north of Ireland back in the in the in 1990s we would go there with a group and we'd be the only ones there there'd be nobody yeah. else yeah. You drive your bus down to it and it'd be just there. You have the whole place. Nowadays, a yeah. lot busier, of course. But a lot but busier, yep. Sometimes there's Dunluce Castle. That's the ancestral home of the McDonnell clan, M C D O N N E L L. That's got a very cool cave underneath, one of the coolest caves I've ever seen. Wow. Because underneath that castle, there's a cave that you can climb down into. And when you get into it, it's the size of a cathedral. And it opens out into the ocean on the other side. And the McDonald's used to keep their boats in there, a bit like the Batcave. 
Yep. Oh, nice. Today. nice. What do we have here? That's um, the, the dark hedges from the very famous TV series Game of Thrones. And the previous castle, Dunluce, that's featured in Game of Thrones as well. Um, Game of Thrones was filmed uh, in Northern Ireland for probably close to a decade and it was a big blockbuster. So it's a big part of tourism in, in Northern Ireland. And also there's, they've opened a new uh, Game of Thrones visitor studio experience up there. Um, I remember when we got here, I just love doing this when I'm guiding a tour or on, on one of our buses is, can we stop? We'll get out and walk. So we stopped the bus, we got out and we walked the whole length of this amazing street. And then we met our bus and we carried on. Lots of fun to be had all over the Irish, uh, Ireland, North and South. And uh, when you go, it's just awfully nice to have a guide and a bus and a driver and a plan so you can get the most out of your precious vacation time. We Americans have the shortest vacations in the rich world. We need to use our days carefully. So here, if you look at um, the basic route, you've got uh, the numbers are how many nights we stay in each spot. On a two week tour of Ireland, I'd fly into Dublin, couple of days there, drive south and see that wonderful medieval rock of Cashel on top of the, the rock uh, down to Kinsale with the, the gourmet, the self-proclaimed gourmet capital of Ireland with the star fort over to Dingle Peninsula, three nights in Dingle, all that side tripping around the peninsula and a chance to enjoy the pub scene. And then up to the Cliffs of Moher and to Galway with a side trip to the remote Aran Islands and then driving up via Westport to the uh, Northern Ireland and to stay in Portrush and check out Derry and the Antrim coast and finish with the finale in Belfast. If you can afford two weeks, that's a great, you can say you've done Ireland. If you want another look at that, Stephen was instrumental in helping us with our crew film three TV shows on Ireland. We've got an hour and a half. One's on Northern Ireland, one's on Dublin, and one's on the South and the West. And it's three of my favorite shows. That's an hour and a half that you can get an education just by watching the three half hour episodes. If you go to ricksteves.com, you'll find every TV show we've ever made. And that helps you understand what's on the tour. That helps you understand what you could aspire to do, what I would recommend you do if you had me sit down and explain to you what, what you should do on your vacation by my experience. A lot of people ask me, Rick, I'm going to Ireland, I'm going to Scotland, I'm going to Norway, I'm going to Portugal, what should I do? What you should do is see what I put into my TV shows because that really is a visual look at what I would recommend that you do when you are on your own. And of course, if you pick up the guidebook, you've got all of what's necessary. And it just occurred to me, Ireland and Iceland, it's just one letter difference in the cover, but there's a whole slew of difference in all of the information that can help you turn your travel dreams into very smooth and efficient reality. If you've got less time for Ireland, well, then you can have the eight day approach. This is the heart of Ireland. And um, boy, that's a great itinerary if you just got a week or eight days. Remember, our tours are unique. All of the sightseeing is included for no extra cost. Uh, you've got a small group, 24 to 28 people on a 50 seat bus instead of 50 people on a 50 seat bus. Most important, you got the services of a guide like, like Stephen, who's paid up front and is not angling for tips and kickbacks and on what you buy and commissions on what tours he sells you. Uh, you know, everything's included. All the group transportation's included. I love our accommodations. One thing great about a small group of 24 to 28 people is you can have more interesting accommodations. Like Stevens uh, Millfield Guesthouse in Dingle, a big tour of 50 people could never stay there, but we can comfortably stay in these characteristic smaller guest houses. All your breakfast, half your dinners, and most importantly, a smart itinerary run by uh, Rick Steves Guide. Uh, if you want more information, go to our website at ricksteves.com. That's where you can go to sign up for more of these uh, uh, travel festival even evenings. Uh, you can go and watch ones we've already had in the last couple of weeks. You can see all our TV shows and you can learn what's left in our tours. I do know there are lots of seats still available for the Ireland tours. Uh, remember, we're going to draw two names next Monday on our grand finale. And that will be a total of four one week city tours that we've given away to make this festival a little more of a festival. And you can't all get a free tour, but anybody who signs up for a tour gets $100 off if they sign up during this month. So if anything tickles your fancy there, use the promo code and you'll save $100 each. 
I asked my staff to put together this little tally of what's still available on our tours. We've got about 30,000 seats on about 1,200 different tours that we're planning and hoping to take around Europe this next year. And uh, we're about 80% sold out right now. We still have oh, around 5,700 seats left on 500 departures. And by looking at this, you can see what is still available. And when you go to our website, you can see exactly where those seats and where those departures are. But if we look for Ireland, you see there's 41 departures that still have seats available. And out of those 41 departures, there's almost 500 seats open. So plenty of seats right now. And if you'd like to get in on that and get a little discount because of the festival, you know how to do that. Tomorrow, we're going to be joined by Holger Zimmer from Berlin. And we're going to go to Germany and talk about our coverage of Germany and Austria. And there's a lot to see and do in Germany, Austria. That is for sure. And I can hardly wait to take you there. And uh, after that, we've got Belgium, Netherlands, Greece, Italy, and our grand finale on Monday the 30th. So Stephen McPhillamy, I'm so thankful to be able to have this hour with you. And I know that it's a little bit late for you, but it seems like you've survived it. And I would like to say, awesome. up. And you. thank you very much. Mm. And I bet Lisa has some questions for us. Lisa, are you there? Wonderful information, gentlemen. Thank you so much. You know, I learn every time I hang out with Stephen, I learn something. I, the beautiful thing about somebody who's meant to be a tour guide, they just love to teach. And I've known Stephen for more than 30 years, and I'm always learning by hanging out with Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Mm. Okay, um, this is an easy question, but about 10 people asked it, so I thought it deserved an answer. Um, are there any problems driving between Northern Ireland and the Republic? Are there any border issues? Uh, no, not right now. Possibly in the future, maybe with Brexit and everything, but right now, absolutely not. Uh, the only difference is the line on the side of the road changes from yellow to white and from miles to kilometers. Just mm. Okay. Um, and Marsha wants to know, what are some areas that are great for outdoorsy people? You mentioned the greenways. Are there is there a center for hiking? Well, there's a lot of choice. Like, a, I think my favorite would be the Wicklow Mountains just outside Dublin, Glendalough, which we all know well. Some really nice hikes out there um, and well-signed, uh, good quality trails. Uh, lots of little pubs along the way if you want to stop and have a, something to eat or have a drink. But uh, and, and, not, and not incredibly difficult, you know, not we're not talking very high mountains, but very, very scenic. Very nice. Thank you. Actually, one called the Wicklow Way. It's very nice. There's one you can climb in on your bare feet or something, isn't there? Yeah, that's Crow Patrick over in Westport, where St. Patrick went and banished the snakes from Ireland because we don't have any snakes, of course. And uh, that's that's no, that's tough climb, especially in your bare feet. <laughs> Rick, this question is for you. What are your impressions of driving in Ireland? We have a lot of viewers tonight who want to know how difficult really is it to drive in Ireland as an American, North American? I've driven a lot in Ireland and uh, you spend a lot of time on narrow roads, like um, one and a half lanes wide and it's two lane traffic with not much of a shoulder. And um, it's just unnerving when people are coming out you when it's that, um, narrow so you just got to take your time um and um uh, it's so scenic that you really got to make a point to stop and get out i really love the idea of stopping at a scenic pullout and take a break and don't be in a rush it's a small island but it takes you longer than you'll think to get from a to b um uh, of course there's there's main roads there's highways that you can if you want to just get from belfast from dublin to uh, Galway or from Belfast to Dublin, you could do it on a freeway all the way. But I love exploring in Ireland and exploring in Ireland comes with narrow roads. And if you're in a near head on collision, you should just assume you have forgotten that you're supposed to be on the other side of the road. It's not the right side or the wrong side. It's the other side. And you have your sword hand on the inside this way against your oncoming traffic so you can drive defensively. Oh. Rick, Rick, I have a friend works in a rental car company, and he claims that most of the accidents occur within five miles of the airport once they hit the first roundabout. Ah, yes. <laughs> Pick the car up at the airport. I think that's a good idea because you don't have to get out of the big city. 
And I don't doubt that a lot of the accidents are right off the bat. Roundabouts are unnerving. A lot of people get really nervous about a roundabout, uh, Stephen, because Americans just can't handle no stop sign. And uh, what I always tell people is you don't need to get it right the first time. Go into the roundabout and just intend to go around a few times. Check out your options. Talk it over with your partner. Nobody knows yeah. you're in your third loop yet because nobody else is going around more than once, right? And then when you're good and sure, which is your exit, then you get off. Because if you have to do it the first time, you're all going to be stressed out. And that's dangerous. Exactly. Take your time. Better to be early. Uh, sorry, better to be late in this life than early for the next. So nice and toga boge. Take it easy. <laughs> that's a very good line. Okay. Uh, this is for both of you. Is there any place that we didn't cover tonight that you would like us to know about? Something that didn't make the book or the tour that you wish you could share with us? Hmm. I'll let Rick go first there. Well, Newgrange and Noth, which Stephen mentioned, but we didn't have photographs of, these are the almost like, well, they're these like Stonehenge kind of mound, burial mounds from 5,000 years ago or something. Those are great. Um, I would have liked to show more of how vibrant Belfast is. And um, I think I would have liked to show Blasket Islands off of Dingo, which have a very unique culture of their own. I think it was the only culture in Ireland, the only community in Ireland that didn't suffer from the potato famine because they didn't eat potatoes. They lived off the sea. The un now uninhabited Blasket Islands off of the tip of Slayhead and Dingo Peninsula. And I'm partial to Donegal, of course. And I, I was just there last week. I brought my in-laws over to uh, Glen Bay National Park. And it was like the second week of January and it was, there was not, not only no tourists around, there was no people around and it was bleak and it was windy and it was cold, but it was beautiful. And we went to, we went over to uh, uh, Leo's Tavern. It's a pub nearby where uh, uh, Leo is, uh, was uh, Enya's father, the famous singer, you know, ah. we're speaking Irish. My brother Kieran and his family live over there and oh, it was just lovely. So Donegal's very remote. If you want off the beaten path, that famous quote, well, that's the spot. Donegal is... Uh, Glen Bay? Glen Bay National Park and Castle, yeah. But it, it, it's, it's remote up there. There's no, no trains to get there or anything. Public transport's not very good. Way up in the north. You, you named it Bleak, and um, I went up there once. Isn't there a place called Bloody Forehead or Foreland or something? <laughs> yeah, they wonderfully named Bloody Foreland, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was so bleak. I couldn't believe it. Um, and it was a very powerful experience. Beautifully bleak. Beautifully bleak. Well, Rick, you mentioned islands, and that's a wonderful segue into um, a question that, again, several people had. Um, Skellig Michael, has the tourism boom from Star Wars died down? Is it still difficult to get to? What would you recommend about Skellig Michael? I think Skellig Michael is one of the most dramatic little slivers of humanity out in the wild sea off of the coast of uh, Ring of Kerry. Um, it just cannot handle a lot of tourism. And I know it's famous because of uh, popular culture and so on. I frankly wouldn't even recommend it if it comes to fighting all of those crowds. It's a precious little bit of medieval Europe um, that is not designed for tourism. And I don't think it can handle many crowds. But I'd be curious to hear what Stephen has to say about Skellig Michael. Yeah, the, the, the Government Heritage Service, the Office of Public Works, it's called. They're, they're very conscious of this and they're trying, to, they're trying to limit the numbers because since Star Wars, then you know, everybody wants to go to Star Wars Island. But oh, it's crazy. See, for even to call it Star Wars Island, I don't like Hollywood tourism anyways. And to me, Skellig Michael is, you know, 800 years ago, no, in 800 AD, 1200 years ago, the most educated scribes in Europe were Irish, Irish monks. Charlemagne imported monks from Ireland to be his scribe. He was the greatest leader in Europe of the Dark Ages, the, middle, the early Middle Ages, from 800 AD. Scribes of Ireland kept literate life alive, and they found the most remote places they could be. Just like a hermit monk in the desert in the Holy Land, they would find a little rock out in the middle of the sea, and that's where they would live their life to be close to God. And it's such a treasure that this survives to this day. And when somebody calls it, what do you call it? Star Wars Island or something like that. It just makes me want to scream, frankly. <laughs> I think if, if, if it's your, 
dream to go there, you should make it like a pilgrimage. It should be your 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 big destination. Stay locally over there in one of the villages and uh, you know, be prepared for the fact that it might be stormy on the day you've booked to go and you might need to wait and go a few days later. Uh, no, no, definitely don't rush it through, but it's... Uh, but this is, if there's a book, it's going to be a theme of, it's the Island of Saint and Sco- Saints and Scholars from the early Middle Ages when, when Ireland kept literate life alive for Europe, you could say, rather than <laughs> the Star Wars. Oh, baby. <laughs> oh, heard of, you. You've heard of the... Um, for people who I want to read on that era, there's a famous book, uh, How the Irish Saved Civilization. Very modest title, but uh, very apt for <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Well, the Romans came all the way to England, but they decided not to mess with Ireland, didn't they? Uh, they're lucky. As I drink as I drink my non-alcohol Guinness, they were lucky. <laughs> I'll, I'll make up for you there, my friend. Um, okay, we have time for one last question. Stephen, what are some of the more interesting souvenirs that your tour members have brought back from Ireland? Hmm. Well, I noticed that these days they're not really looking for the the leprechauns and the, the plastic shamrocks and little little craft shops are springing up all over the place. You know, um, I, like for example, in Dingle on the main street, there's a, a it's called the in English it's called the West Kerry Craft Guild and fourteen local craftspeople have come together and they share the rent there and one is my friend uh, Julie Malone she's the Dingle Druid and she, and she makes um, uh, candles from beeswax you know um, she makes soaps and stuff and people are are buying the candles they're buying the soaps um, they're, they're buying things that are made there's a big hunger now for stuff that's made locally like here I, I'll Although I'm drinking non-alcoholic Guinness tonight, I have Dingle Gin here, and it's produced uh, on the on the Dingle Peninsula, and it, it very modestly claims it's it's the 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 best gin in the world, you know. But uh, there's gin all over America. But when people come to Dingle or come to any town in Ireland where there's gin gin being made, they wanna they wanna buy the local produce and bring it back with them. Tullamore Dew, and you know why it's called Dew? Tell me. Because the man who invented it was David Ellis Williams. That's his initials. There's a full stop between the letters. And full stop. Period. Stephen told, Stephen told me the story earlier today. And go full stop. Now I get it. Full stop means period. Because we would say D period E period W period. And in Ireland, you would say D full stop E full stop. We got a quicker way to say it. But the point is, it's an Irish souvenir. And you can sip that and it takes you back to Ireland. And um, I think it's, uh, Stephen's right. People aren't buying their leprechauns as much anymore. But what we like to do is take a little bit of quality home with you that you can enjoy as part of your life here in another hemisphere and let it take you back there. Every time I sip off of this, I think of our friend at the, the uh, Dingle uh, Crystal, Sean. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I will add one thing to that, gentlemen, because you reminded me that when I was there with my family in Dingle, we saw a local artisan named Brian the Belt, and all of the gentlemen traveling bought leather belts that was made in Dick Mac's pub. Dick Mac. I love Dick Mac's pub. There is so much fun, and we take it in, and that's the beautiful thing about travel. It enriches the rest of our lives because we have this extra dimension that we can draw from all of these rich memories these new ways these different ways to celebrate our lives and uh, the life that we've got here and good friends that we make on the road lisa thank you very much for moderating tonight stephen it's past your bedtime i know you're you're a night owl but it's time for you to hit the sack and uh <laughs> congratulations for you know, all of you that you've done in your amazing life. And I'm, I'm again, I'm thankful you're on our team. And I'm glad you're doing the first and the last Rick Steves Ireland tours in this coming season. Hey, everybody. We'll see you soon. I hope tomorrow night. I hope uh, next Monday for our grand finale. And one way or another, thank you for joining us and happy travels. Good night, Rick. Good night, Stephen. Good night, Good night. Lisa. Good night, Stephen. Thanks. Be Hawaii. Sleep well.